The entrepreneurship in our episode that you're about to watch is unedited and uncut. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform for the edited version. Enjoy. Okay. Yeah. Finally. It's a very arduous process. <laughs> How many takes are we going to do every week just to get the, <laughs> the audio set up? Just unreal. Uh, and everybody thinks that it should be so. It's a plug and play. Plug and play is not a thing. And so it should not, we're, we're relatively smart people, Dan. I believe you have a degree in in or part of your degree is an audio recording. Yeah. My problem was just that I just didn't didn't jiggle the cable. <laughs> no, your 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 problem is that you actually broke the cable every time you tried to store it. Yeah. I did. No, I did. I did. I thought I thought it had a I thought it had a foldable feature. And it, it it does. You can fold it, but if you fold the USB thing, you will break it. But I do I do think that that blue microphone like there's a there's a there's a business opportunity for them because it it seems really logical. I thought, wow, that's kind of nice design. But in fact, it wasn't nice design. It was me just literally breaking the the uh, cable thing, and then then searching frantically through Google to try to find a, a, a Yeti driver. <laughs> like, like I'm in 1995. Yeah. You have to download it, download a driver. Like a, remember that? Remember downloading printer drivers? Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to go to the Epson website that looks like it was built in 1992 and download you know, some file like with an extension, um, like it's like .rqz42, right? Like, and then, Download that and then un unzip it and then install the driver. <laughs> I don't remember this. You're, see, you're too young. Like, like, you're like trying to it. get. But if Dan remembers it. <laughs> but trying to get printers to work was always like, it, it, it required like a degree. Like you, you had to have like a soldering gun mm -hmm. and a, de a, de a degree in, in, I don't even know what like you like you had to know how to like build your own circuit like <laughs> but back to the USB I don't think I've ever seen a USB cable where the metal USB portion actually folds I don't that think there's any be... precedent for you to assume that, that is <laughs> No, there totally is. I, I, I demonstrated ones that it like visually. Slide. I know you demonstrated it visually, but that still did not trigger any recollection from me or Carly by the sound of it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I've seen ones that slide in and have like a plastic casing, but never a folding one where you sever the connection. Or it. I it in and thought it thought it was an ingenious feature by the masterminds at Blue that you could sort of oh. fold the thing. No, you're just breaking it, dude. <laughs> I'm getting pissed off. Why won't this work? Why does this not just plug and play? <laughs> just cracking it back and forth. It's, it's like well, it's, it's like me laugh. you're gonna make heart. me jiggle the thing, and then the blue thing is gonna, gonna be terrible audio. Record. Well, I, I know what I'm patenting. I know as soon as I'm getting off this call, I'm going to the USPTO website. I'm gonna draw my schematic, oh. and then I'm gonna I'm gonna patent this motherfucker. Because it's obvious, like, I, I can't be the only one that would be like, you know what would be cool? If you could plug in the USB thing and then fold it so that it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, you can store it more easily. I don't, I don't know what you need to file a patent, but it doesn't sound mm -hmm. like you've got enough of the technical specs mm -hmm. down <laughs> to mm -hmm. patent that. I'm and also not convinced that there's a market for it just because oh, you there feel is. like it's ingenious. <laughs> well, there, there, I would say there's, there's not a market, there's a licensing market for it. You could license mm. that. No, no, I'm patenting it, and and I, I don't. Dan, you probably you've worked with me long enough. You probably have seen my mad my mad drawing skills. Like I think the world kind of has because like one of the what, the world, yeah, like the, my world, the, the four people in my world that, that listen to my presentations or whatever. Like um, keynote what, drawings, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like one of my favorite ones is like a, a keynote drawing on the Trop of Despair, which is so <laughs> relevant. And I keep thinking about how we need to. Uh, how <laughs> we need to we need to talk about it on this podcast but i i drew it with my apple pencil and like i always preface the, the talk with like you know i was tired and i'm not a very good drawer or whatever and people i think people's expectations are just like yeah no it'll be like you know 
a, a human who's not a great drawer and it, it looks like a palsied like it's just like it's like like someone with parkinson's disease and trembles or whatever like trying to it's so bad and then and i i, I you know trying to draw and then i i uh, <laughs> I go to the next slide. It's like, like it takes a while to get people's attention back because it's so unbelievably bad. It, well, it's and like, each slide is you building on that same line. Yeah. So copying each slide. And right. The context for people that are lit, we'll put it in the show notes, but this should yeah. be a perfectly straight line. It looks like if you ask someone to draw what a rough C would look like yeah. using right. the fourth line. <laughs> right. There's right. nothing straight about it. <laughs> No, I love how you you talk about how you're not a good drawer as if there's going to be like an actual, like a horse on the next slide or something. I can't or, draw or a, a dog. horse. Oh, but I, yeah, I know. But you no, I've tried. A, yeah. A, no, like it's my, one of my favorite, like sometimes I'll be teaching a class and I'll have to like draw some, oh, I know what it is. So I do, I give a talk about um, uh, um, like cash cow, right? Like, you know, mm-hmm. talk about like how every business has to, Every business has kind of a cash cow, and the cash cow starts to <laughs> stops giving milk. And and as your cash cow is giving stops giving milk, you need to kind of be developing your shooting star, which is like a pretty business one hundred and one type lecture, whatever. But every semester, I try to draw a cow. I cannot like it doesn't it doesn't even look like an animal. It's it's just like it's, it's just like weird kind of blobs. And, it, it, I don't know what the. How many years have you been teaching that lecture? A lot. And I you've never thought draw. maybe let me spend thirty minutes on a quiet Sunday <laughs> learning how to draw a cow. <laughs> but like that seems such an abstraction to me. Like I, 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 I could spend like thirty days trying to draw a cow and and like take. Maybe I should take a lesson. Maybe I should like yeah. go to, because like I can't do it. I cannot render what's in my head onto a piece of paper in a visual way like it, it my friend Keith like this was like um this was before just before we just missed it it was like kind of we had this comic book that we did that he would he he thought my draw he would just like ask me to draw things and um and then just giggle because they'd be so bad so he's like let's do a comic book and so and my job was to draw the comic book and, and our character was an infant like make like a four-year-old or whatever three-year-old and and the, and the infant's name <laughs> the infant's name was scotch because we had this we had this like joke that babies loved scotch like that was one thing that you know if, if anything babies really love more than you know whatever it is the baby's like it's scotch and it was actually a really funny comic book but but keith he's just liked it because i had to do the drawing so like okay george draw scotch in the back seat of a car um you know while his parents are arguing in the front seat and then saying you know like there'd be like a bubble saying oh i need some scotch <laughs> it was just like the, the, the renderings of a madman i don't know yeah i still have that over. drawing no, I wish oh, because it, it definitely like it. I was thinking about it the other day because I was talking to Henry about South Park. Like we were talking about like animation and and how how some animation can can like really draw you in, and some of it like you just can't get over it. Or, and and he for the reason he's not. Oh, I know exactly the reason, but uh, he's not really seen South Park. But like their their drawings were very much you know like the Scotch. The Scotch comic was was just a way worse kind of south park like they, they actually kind of seem to choose to draw that way you know i'm sure they could draw like great but i, I can't um but yeah yeah so my schematic for my patent was is, is gonna be <laughs> something to something something that the people at the uspto are probably gonna have to look closely at whatever their normal rejection time is for a patent is gonna take mm-hmm. <laughs> for them <to> <laughs> <laughs> like, one, no. one look at the drawing <laughs> nope no, denied yeah, like did someone's five-year-old kid send in <laughs> i know and that's how i always feel like when i leave like i try to be a, a good you know colleague and erase my whiteboard or whatever at the end of a class or something but um <laughs> but sometimes i don't and and, and I, I worry like what people must think wandering into my classroom um afterwards and looking at at the whiteboard that's up there i mean it's just Oh, it, I mean, it's just like, it, I mean, like a Rube Goldberg machine of, of lines and squiggles and random words and things, but you know, it's the inside of my brain. 
and I love it. Um, so I don't know if it's a class or a talk that you've done. There's been a few times where you've done a talk, you've written stuff up on a board or whatever, and then people take photos of it. Yes. Yes. And it's like, how is that possibly going to help you? Just write down <laughs> what he's saying. Because you're not going to be able to decipher it. Uh, one of those was when we were doing the, the talks in Mexico. Dude, people that did not speak English taking photos of your writing, which is ineligible even to someone that speaks English. Like, what are you going to use with these photos? Well, well, and I feel so bad because, um, you know, increasingly colleges are admitting students where English is just not their first language, right? And like um, Berkeley has a, has a, a large population of, of Asians and, and, you know, I speak quickly and, and then, yeah, as you say, I just, I write stuff on the board and it, it, it's, it's, as you say, it's the, the, the goal of the writing on the board isn't so much like, okay, copy it. It's more just to kind of, it's just the rhythm of the class. Like it's just, it's just how I teach and, and I'll, I'll write a word up there and then kind of teach around that word. I don't expect people to parse it out. And it also, like, there's a bit of a method to my madness. Like it also slows me down because once, once I get going, you know, and then, um, and then I will know that I have to translate. So I'll just scrawl some gibberish up there and be like, okay, now let me read this to you. And I, and, and I've taken to telling students, I think this is, this is good advice. Generally, like, don't write while I'm talking, like, like, let me write it down. Let me talk and then write it down. Cause you try to do several things at once, but, um, uh, but as I say, there are a lot, a lot of non-native English speakers that, that are in my class, which is tricky. And I think a, 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 a questionable business decision at times. But, um, but yeah, they'll, they'll, like, I know they're not understanding my, my, you know, me talking because I, I speak quickly. And if, if English isn't your first language. And then, yeah, at the end of the class, they will walk up and take pictures of the whiteboard. I'm like, and I'll stop them. I'll be like, look, come to my office hours. Let's talk this through because I can't imagine that that's going to do anything other than confuse you. But do you allow people to take voice memos or audio Absolutely. lectures? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do that and they'll have to film it, whatever. I mean, I, I think that there is a certain point like where colleges are going to have to, because like whatever the topol or TOEFL or what's the chocolate, the, the like Rolos like kind of. Um, I don't know. But like the, the where English the test that you have to take um, where you lost. Yeah. Sorry. No, but what's that chocolate? Like to, to, Toblerone. Um, um, How but, is that like Rolos? It's not. I mean, it kind of, it's kind of like a similar like vibe to a Rolo. It's it's Made sort of like chocolate. No, but it's like Rolo's cousin, like a Toblerone. No, disagree. Fully disagree. Know. Yeah. No. I anyway. <laughs> <laughs> go on go on get well, but like to, to, what's the test the Tofel? metaphor is lost tofel tofel what's the test what that, that somebody has to take in order to to like be yes you have sufficient uh language skills to oh to be. okay yeah yeah um anyway whatever the the, the Toblerone yeah. test, the TOEFL test. Um, yeah, the Rolos I, test, right. Yeah, yeah, I think that the, I think the bar may be pretty low. You know, like if, it, 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 you know, I think, I don't think it's a rigorous test that, like to pass the TOEFL test or something. Um, and so I think that the colleges are going to have to increasingly be like, have a translator. Like, you know, I mean, if we're going to have 40% Asian students and the, the Toblerone test is, is like, can you, can you say hello? Can you say stop that tickles? Ah, you're in, you know, then, um, then <laughs> <laughs> if that's the extent of like the English, you know, like as long as you can say hello and um, excuse me, please stop that tickles. Um, you, you can, you are allowed to come into this, this university. Okay. Then you need to have translate. you ever, have you ever learned a second language, George? I'm terrible at it. Like I, I'm so, a, but have I'm you an ever had a course or used like the, you know, like a Duolingo app or have you ever done any no. kind of, no. and so you just assume that like language 101 is hello mm. and stop that tickles. <laughs> <laughs> That's just. Well, I mean, you think I'm just trying to think it, of like, like things that you would need. Like everybody used to say hello. And I think, why would you need to say that? <laughs> to say well, you get I mean, tickled by strangers as you walk down the street. Well, no, it would I mean, explain like, so much about George if that was just his reality. 
<laughs> well, no, but I, I mean, like that would be a phrase that I would want to know. Like, if I'm if I'm coming into a foreign, if if I'm coming into another country, I want to know like how to say like where's the bar, how to sure. order a margarita. Sure. Stop that tickle seems like <laughs> something you you want to know. No. Maybe maybe people just don't come up to me and want to tickle me. Maybe it's a way. No, but I, I don't want to be tickled ever, know. right? Or like just. Well, just apparently just, it's an issue. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't love being touched. You know. So like I. I want. I want to be. You know. Just be able to get, stop. You know. Come. Come on. Stop the tickles. How, how do you say that in another language? Well, I, I think Carly in the show knows. Shockingly, translate as that someone, in a couple languages. Yeah, but shockingly, as someone that has learned a few languages, that has never come up in any course material that I've come across. But can you can you say it? And you're you're fluent in French. How do you say "stop that tickles"? Um, I don't actually know how you say. See, tickle, it again, seems, it's just not a word that comes up that much. It seems to me that this would be certainly within the first year of any language <laughs> class, stop that tickles would come up. When's the last time you said that in English before this <laughs> conversation? <laughs> in an but actual I situation? I've, I know I've got it in my back pocket if I need <laughs> it, you know? I get, yeah, it's chatouille in French, but I mean like, I just can't think of a, I have no idea what it is in German. I'm sure it's something beautiful, though. <laughs> That'd be the one phrase I'm that sure is beautiful that... in German. Yeah, <laughs> just rolls I'm off sure the tongue. they don't even have a word for it. It'll be like, of, of all languages, they wouldn't have a cute, like, ah, oh, yeah, tickle. Germans have no tickle like... reflex. No, they don't have, they, they, it's like sarcasm. The word just doesn't translate. They just don't have a word for tickle. Like Native American, oh, that's funny. Like, was it like certain indigenous cultures like have like four hundred words for water and stuff, right? Like, yeah. I, would, I wonder what culture has like lots of different words for tickles. Japan. Know, there's probably some really happy culture. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, no. Really happy culture. So now you're equating tickling with overall like health and happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever countries have the highest GDP must have the most words for tickle. <laughs> now, now that I'm thinking, isn't tickling so, it's such a rare thing where inside is pure pain and torture and outside yeah. is pure laughter? Yeah. Which is very German by nature, actually. So maybe they do have a... No, they're the opposite. Outside is angry, inside is joy. They, they are the reverse tickle. They're the anti- but so yeah. now, But so they do have a word for it. It's just schadenfreude, right? Like there must be some, some variant of schadenfreude. Taking pleasure yeah. in someone else's pain, right? Yeah. I think yeah. I think the actual yeah. literal translation of Schadenfreude is stop that tickle. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, so what did you all write about this week? I didn't write about anything this week. Oh. What'd you do all week? Um Yeah, it's a good question. This week is kind of a blur. Oh my gosh. They all sort of blur together, but yeah. I wrote um, a lot. Well, why don't you tell us that you wrote a lot? No, but isn't isn't part of the whole jam of this thing to be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna write something and we're gonna talk about well, our, I'll, our I'll talk about what I did because oh, that'll okay. also force me to finish it before this podcast comes out. What's uh, the what's the and I want to hear I'm sorry to interrupt. What this is good. This is like because I can never this will force me to remember it. There's a law and somebody can Google it. I can't I can't remember who's oh I, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I think it's Parkinson's law. I think Parkinson's law states that the scope of a, of a project expands in direct proportionality to the time that you have. And basically the, 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 the reason that that's important is that it, it forces you to have limits where it says, no, this has to be done. And I see this constantly in so many businesses with which I work or, or, or my own or whatever, where if once you, once you don't have a due date or a date certain, it never gets done and the scope yeah. of the project just goes on and on. And it's one of the reasons I love this podcast. Cause it's like, I, I know that we're going to talk and I'm, I want, I'm going to get my piece done. Whereas if I'm like, okay, well we'll do, we'll do the podcast when the piece is done. You mm -hmm. never finish the piece, <laughs> mm -hmm. but True. I think it's a, it's a really good business, you know, um, mantra. And, and, and if someone can Google whatever. I, I do like the fact that it's a podcast where it's like, like it reminds me of the Ron Burgundy podcast where, um, you know, at the end of they kind of do the, the fact checking because like everything that they're like, Ron, um, 
it, it's it's laryngitis, not laryngitis, as you call it. <laughs> There's a whole podcast. But I'm pretty sure it's Parkinson's law, but it may be some other one way or the other. It's it's a good business kind of kind of or any project to have in your mind. You've got to have a date set where it's like, no, it'll be done at this time, or else the scope will just go on and on forever. You never finish it. Part of it is it's like when you're setting your KPIs for anything. So with this mm-hmm. being a, a quote unquote media company, this is the way I try to yeah. see it. Uh, consistency is a KPI, right? Mm-hmm. So right. Yes. that allows you to set artificial deadlines. No one's waiting for me to put out my piece, yeah. no. but no. one of my KPIs is consistency, which means every week something has to happen. Yeah. Um, and I have been coasting on the remote musicians handbook just oh part four (laughs) (laughs) it's like it's like it's like a half life like the the parts keep getting smaller you know it's like you know (laughs) part 18 it's just like a word (laughs) and for Um, people who don't know kpi is key performance indicator and and it's one of those what i call uh tlas um business business world is full of tlas three-letter acronyms right um you know and, you know, a marketing qualified lead is an MQL, uh, a unique selling proposition is a USP, net promoter score is NPS, and KPI is key performance indicator, one of many TLAs, CPM. three letter acronyms. CPM, which is cost CPM. per thousand cost views. Per thousand. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. right. But um, it's funny that the, the TLA is a three letter acronym for a three letter acronym. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah but speaking you of, your, of your handbook, though, Dan, we didn't even talk about parts for your last time, actually, I realized after, because you had put it up. And when George asked the question, what we had written last week, um, you didn't even talk? bring it up. No. No. Yeah, we're doing something that's more fun now. Uh, well, oh, not gosh. more fun. Uh, well, it's, but, what are, like, but you're working you on talk? something different? Yes, I am working on something new, but it, it feels like, you know, when you're talking with artists and the second they put out their album, it's like they don't care about it anymore. They're ready for the next yes. album, it's, it's, which is a huge problem. Sh- because then they're not, yeah, shiny object, not enthusiastic enough to actually promote the album they just released, which is new to everyone else. But I don't know. I mean, I just, I wrote that handbook like a month and a half ago now. So it's so distant. Oh. Um, part three is about subscription platforms. That's right. Wow. I, I know my <laughs> own handbook. I mean, it's, um, I don't want to go too in depth in it because it, it get, that section gets a little bit in the weeds um, about the different platforms that are available and what makes sense. But I do frame Patreon as kind of the de facto subscription platform for any creator. The idea being, especially now when you need a reliable alternate source of revenue, having what is essentially a fan club, right? I mean, I remember paying mm-hmm. annual fees for fan clubs, but they don't seem to be very prevalent anymore. And it was, it was usually like major artists that would have paid yeah. fan clubs. I'm, um, I'm still a proud member of the REM fan club. What are the annual dues on that? And it's free and they actually don't, they don't like, they don't like people talking about it anymore because like they don't want to shut it down, but then they keep it going. But it was, it was, you just have to, you had to write them, send them like a, a self-addressed stamp envelope and you used to get really, really badass stuff. Like I've got REM Christmas singles and all these, these great things. And then they blew up and, and they didn't want to change the terms. But no, it wasn't. But it, it wasn't. There was no dues around it. I mean, if it's free, it's basically a fancy newsletter, right? Correct. Um, yeah, but, but, but yeah. you got to remember, this is going back to like <laughs> literally 1986 or 84 or something. Archaic was, times. Yeah. Yes, the <laughs> Mesozoic era. Um, but the point with this is, you need reliable recurring revenue. Um, doing a membership uh, service with your fans is a great way to do it, and I love Patreon because they let you set tiers. Um, I arbitrarily put five, ten, and fifteen dollar tier recommendations. Um, I think it's important to have something that's in the single digits because as soon as you hit ten dollars per month, elasticity, elasticity, and you're competing with Netflix. And when people are mm. creating, like doing that kind of value balance judgment, mm. well, for Netflix or Spotify, I get all the music in the world or more yeah. videos than I ever had to watch. Yeah. And so, as an artist, you're really trading on sentimental value of the work that you do and a little bit on kind of exclusivity um and so when you're coming up with these the the benefits um because you need to it needs to be a value transfer it needs to be you are you the fan are paying five ten dollars fifteen bucks a month i the artist am giving you x and i i love i love thinking of value transfer as you always if it's a 51 49 percent kind of value transfer one party is giving 51 percent 
the other party is always going to feel like they're getting a better deal. So if as an artist, you can over deliver and for, I don't know, five bucks a month, you do exclusive live streams, you do demos that aren't really suit for publishing publicly, but that core set of fans would love it. Uh, that's, I mean, I, I, I subscribe to a few Patreons and I think that's a really great way to make a little bit of extra money and give fans what they want. I mean, for my favorite artists, if I could get, you know, a handful of demos that are recorded monthly. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's just, they know they have to deliver a demo a week. So they think, oh, what song do I want to record today? Let me just record it as a voice memo and post it on Patreon. I would be fine with that. Cause that's, yeah. it's, it's that exclusivity and scarcity that is kind of hard to get when everything is digital. Uh, yeah, totally. And this, this goes to the whole, you know, risk of commoditization. If you, if, I mean, there is fatigue. There is, there is mm -hmm. very much subscription fatigue where it's just like, man, I can't. And particularly in these times where I think everyone should be, if they're not kind of reassessing, um, you know, how much they're spending and, and how much of it was really, there's a certain um, stoicism that I think like is, is probably part of, part of what's going on with people right now um, in the sense of like, in, in the classical sense, stoicism is just kind of just having what you need, rather, and, and like the reassessment of of what is it that we need, and I think that that COVID nineteen is is likely forcing a lot of people to reassess kind of that that dynamic of need want basis, and and I mean just from a personal um, perspective, pre this time, I, I would go out to eat every night. You know, and 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 part of that's situational. It's just I'm, I'm busy. It's the end of the day, and I, and I, I love like I think the the perfect bar, maybe the perfect place. Um, it, you know, my my like Maddie's here in Marblehead is is to my mind a perfect place, and and it is you know as Hemingway would say a, a clean, well lighted room, and it's just the the, the perfect perfect bar, um, like a bar of, in heaven or something, and and so. Perfect. The lighting, um, the the lack of music, the um, it's just it. it what do you mean per lack <clears throat> lack of music? Lack of music that he doesn't like to listen to, bro. No, for the most part, it's just like there's just rarely any music at all. There's just the ambient noise of conversation, which I find beautiful, right? And and um, I, I do have I do have really like I'll leave restaurants um, when when they're I've left many restaurants just because they're they're musical both volume level and choices are so um, distasteful to me that I can't enjoy the meal. Like I just like it, and I know that sounds like a, but it, it really, as a musician, as an artist, as someone whose brain is tuned into those things and people always like, just shut it out. I, I, I can't, you know, it just, and, and so, um, you know, if there's some smooth jazz, going on in some restaurant or something like I, I'll I'll just leave like I can't I can't do it and I, I, I there was a restaurant here in town <clears throat> and I went down I want to support the local restaurants and I'm sitting sitting at the bar and um you know the, like I think they had one speaker and and I was like directly positioned in front of it and they were just blasting kind of mid-90s you know rock like I, I don't even I'm trying to think of like what that would be but like smash mouth yeah. or something huh <laughs> yeah, it was like smash mouth you know and 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 it's a nice restaurant and and i'm trying to eat or whatever and and i i uh eventually get the bartender's attention and i, I point at the speaker and i just say why and he says what do you mean and um and he's and i said well you, you have a nice place here and and but the, the music's like aggressively loud and it's smash mouth like it doesn't like it, it it doesn't make any sense like there's no rhyme or reason to it and he goes oh well you know one of the uh servers or whatever likes it i was like yeah that, that may be true and it may, it may be doing the job to be done for a server like if, if you're wandering around maybe you do need smash mouth or whatever to keep your energy level up but as someone who just like wants to sit there and and eat their you know calamari or whatever like i i, I don't want to hear Hey now, da, 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 da. like I, it, it like it will make like it makes me like it, 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 I lose my appetite. It, it it makes me mad. Like it makes me like it, it, like I get mad that that song like was such a hit. Like it's it's not a song. Like I don't know what that is, but it's not a song. It's like it's it's an ad. I don't know what it or who it's an ad for. But I don't um, think that's fair to say. That's... No, it's not. 
It's a song. It's not a song. It's a catchy enough beat that you can see. You've probably listened to it five times in your life and you can recite it. I mean, no, I've listened to it like five million times. That's my problem. Like, it's one of those songs that, that like, you can't go anywhere without hearing that song. And it, it's I have not, not a... heard that song in years. I cannot remember the last time that I heard that song. I was listening to um, every, every night at dinner, I choose a different pre-made Apple Music playlist and I put on um, 1999 alt rock hits and that song came on during Gosh. dinner. And I loved it. <laughs> I was not in forever. And I was like, this is a jam. No, it's not. <laughs> you it's just, like, it's, it, you, I think it's like, I, like, I think the CIA or someone like might have cooked it up. Like Carly mentioned MK Ultra um, last week. Like, I think it's like a mind experiment. Like, it's, it's not good for you. Like, that song like is Like music bad. is torture, how they like, mm-hmm. will yeah, exactly. blare like yeah, no, hardcore like, like, like when to people. Tra- and but like that it. I get. Like, like if I was, if I was, some dictator fascist and they were trying to torture me in my jail cell and they like blasted slayer at me I'd be like yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. You can play rain and, bl- rain and blood ladies. they're horrible <laughs> like i can't i don't think again i don't think that's music i don't know what it is but like i, I talked about this in one of the earlier podcasts like i have this synesthesia like where it shapes and and though those types of it, it like it it physically hurts me. Like I I can't hear the bare naked ladies. Like I I will, I will leave. Bare naked. A, yeah, I will leave a place. <laughs> I am Pronounce so ready it. for the entrepreneurship in our karaoke night. Oh my gosh! Now okay, so my, you now I've got my playlist set. Okay, this is a fun topic because I was talking about karaoke not that long ago. I think karaoke is a fun thing to do. George could not have disagreed with me more. There it's are certain things. It's one of those things where, like, I'm I'm trying to think of the dollar amount that would get me to do karaoke, and I think it's over five thousand. Like, when you I think, think about that, it in terms of the alcohol amount that would get you to do karaoke, because that's that's what is key. I could not do karaoke sober, but I don't know what like I don't know what what makes someone think to themselves. I know what I want to do. I want to leave this place that I'm in where I have like books and like Netflix and my stuff and go to some place where I have to listen to people sing badly. Ah. So what about private karaoke room? Don't think karaoke Thank you. Are a private karaoke room in like Dan. Koreatown, New York. So, okay. I'm, I'm going to try to I, like, I, I, I've, Carly and I have talked about that. I, I, I will try this. Like I, I've never been to a private karaoke room. I don't like to me. If you put those three words together, private karaoke room, it sounds like a torture chamber to me. Like that. That sounds like somebody with your friends like, and alcohol. I know his version of torture. Torture is not other people's but so so, so like when you ask you when you ask me like what i love about maddie's it's it's uh, it sounds almost like the opposite of a private karaoke room like it's like everybody leaves me alone in there i go the the waitresses and the and the and the bartenders know me so like they and they keep people away from me um i sit there i do my crossword puzzle i read my cookbooks um they they have a, a very heavy hand with their poor um, there's no, and everybody leaves me alone and it's heaven, heaven and private karaoke room sounds like the opposite of that, but I'll try it. Well, I'd say, I'd say a public karaoke bar definitely sounds like the opposite of that <laughs> private karaoke room. I think is a little bit closer to something that would not be classified as torture in the George book of torture techniques. You're I'm in a room with people that you enjoy spending time with. You are all choosing the songs. Whoever is singing them is choosing to sing that song because they either love that song or they're going to have a really fun time singing that song for whoever else is in the room. So it's, it's like a like, talent show, an amateur talent show. No, because you're not, you're not trying to prove anything. That's part no, of No, there's the no winner. Of, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's, I don't understand. Well, also think it's 
for people that are not musicians, there's not a whole lot of options to hold a microphone and sing yeah. something that you really enjoy. It is yeah, but I think that's a good thing. <laughs> like, I think that that's, that's good. It, it'd be, it'd be like, like, I, 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 I don't, I'm trying to think of an analogy. Like, I don't think, I think that's okay. I don't think everybody needs to be a singer. I agree, but you don't think everyone should get the option to live out that fantasy for one drunken night in in a so, private room but i don't want to watch it like i just I, there's just so many other things that i would rather do with my time than watch somebody butcher a song that i probably already hate you're going to hate most of the songs in the karaoke book i think that's fair i yeah. I, I love the idea i i can see you going through the list ahead of time and being like yeah. here i've crossed out all the ones we're not allowed to do <laughs> And looking through it, and it's just like pages of red lines <laughs> over songs. George isn't invited to karaoke night. But that's a, but I that, I I I'd, I'd appreciate that. Yeah. The, the, like, but I'm, I but I, I and I, I will do it. I'll do it with I will do it with gusto. Like I I will I will I will pick a song. I bet they have. I bet there's like it's the key that like not like people have a, a range. Like I don't understand mm -hmm. how they know what your range is, right? And I don't think most people know what their range is. And it's just like, they're not good. Like you can't be like, oh, okay, yeah, I want to sing Man on the Moon by R.E.M., but I need you to put it in the key of whatever, right? <laughs> it's just going to be in the key of whatever. So it's so, some you can choose the key, but I, I've got a, oh, such a bad karaoke memory. I used to, um, when I was 18, I used to play bar shows. I was a bar uh -huh. singer, um, oh, play gigs. Um, and then I, I went out to do karaoke night after I turned 21. I was all excited. Um, and one song came up that was on my set list that I used to, I had sung a hundred times. And I was like, oh, I'll do this. I'd forgotten that I bring it down like four keys in order to right. sing. Right. Just butchered it publicly in this, in this karaoke bar. It was horror. It was such a scar. And, and like while you were in the middle of it, weren't you like, I need this to stop. Like, like, weren't you getting sweaty and like, 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 I need, I need to not be singing the song. It's, and it's in, not in my range. I can't hit these notes. Yeah. I don't know. So, I mean, something about playing a bunch of bars when I was 18 kind of makes me not care what drunken people yeah, yeah. think about me. So I've played my share of drunken bars, like, but, and, 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 you know, but they're songs, like I choose the songs that I was mm -hmm. going to play or write songs in my range, you know, and I've got a specific range. I can't, I can't, I can't just, I'm not going anyway, I, I, I guess that's part of the fun of it and I'm just missing it. Everyone's back. Seeing, yeah. That is yeah. Seeing people fun. kind mm -hmm. of struggle with it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, back to our, our pieces. Can I talk about mm -hmm. the piece I'm really excited about? Yes, of course. Please do. I'm so yeah. excited. Okay. Oh, but, but before you get to, before you get to, like, your time at Patreon, I just want to, like, do a shout out because there are alternatives, right? Yes. First, there, there's Gumroad, which, mm -hmm. you know, you can think of what you will, but that, that was, I think, predated Patreon, and that allows you to have kind of more of your own autonomy. I guess you don't have kind of um, uh, more of, like, the, the network effects that maybe Patreon has where there's a browsing thing. And then right. also, I do, I do wonder, like, it, <laughs> There's benefit to Patreon, but they're certainly going to take their cut as they should. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what about just going directly from your website? Like, why why do we need that intermediary? I mentioned all of these. Okay, great. I mentioned great. Gumroad in the handbook. I talk about Shopify's e-commerce integration, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you can do a subscription setup. Part of the hardest part of the subscription setup is these recurring payments that you don't want to yeah. have to manage. Right, 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 right. Um, right, right. So it's it's kind of worth paying an, an extra one percent fee to cover that. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I don't want to go down the whole blockchain rabbit hole, though I did give a talk at consensus, but um, what's that? Oh, no, nothing. But it, it'd be nice to like avoid those types of transaction costs, right? And just have more in the artist's pocket. But I, I, I do get it. Yeah. But anyway, go, go, go to your piece that you're excited about. Um, so this is, I, I mentioned it briefly last week. Um, I'm bringing back the music industry swipe file. I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing it as a video. This is our pivot to video that George, you so thoroughly understood. <laughs> no, I, I, I still don't, but I did listen it's, back to the recording and I think I have some sense of what you're talking about. Uh, it just means that I'm coming yeah, up with I get new it, videos. I get it, I get it, yeah. um, and so I looked at three ads this past week and I've shot this video three different times because 
I looked really grungy before I got my hair cut. Um, and I was like, you know what? It's probably worth a sh- shoot. And your dad gave you a haircut, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was after my girlfriend and my mom failed. Um, and I, re- I realized, I thought they'd be perfect at it. I thought they're great. They're, they're both kind of artsy and crafty and they, can, they know how to handle scissors, right? Um, but they also have not been going to a barbershop for the past 58 years of their lives, which my dad has. And he was eating his lunch, like sitting outside watching my girlfriend and my mom try to do it. And he's like, you guys have no idea what you're doing. I couldn't see what was going on. So he walks around, he goes to the back of my head and he just lets out like this audible gasp. And he's like, what have you done? <laughs> uh, but then he did it, huh? While he was eating later, his lunch? He fixed it afterwards. He, okay. he swallowed the last half of the sandwich. Um, but One of my earliest memories yeah. is being like five or six or something. And like, like we're, we didn't have any money, you know? And, and like my dad stuck me in a tub and and cut my hair and it was like a like literally like stuck a bowl on my head and then just cut around it and i remember going to school and just like crying like just being like oh gosh and then henry my 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 soon to be 14 year old he 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 got his head he needed a haircut and and he does kind of what i do is just lets it grow until it's just like unruly and then just kind of buzzes it off um but he got his head that he wanted his hair cut his haircut to resemble Mark Brandanowitz. Does that reference mean anything to anybody? Nope. No. He was in the first two seasons of Parks and Rec. He was he was kind of like a main character. He was just like this random guy. He was like, I want my haircut like Mark Brandanowitz from Parks and Rec. <laughs> One of the most specific things that he didn't get it. He got all upset because like he got his hair that doesn't look you know, like Mark Brandanowitz. <laughs> anyway. I'm going to get a schmohawk a la Larry David. All right, so so Dan, your piece, your haircut, your your piece, all of the above. <laughs> uh, so the whole point of the music industry swipe file is looking at what other, usually artists, but this time I chose some companies, what they're doing for social media advertising and kind of pulling some lessons from that, that independent artists, independent labels, whoever could apply to their own advertising practices. So I looked at three different companies, uh, Twitch, the live streaming platform, Spotify, and uh, Kalani. Um, oh yeah, they're 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 doing a ton of. With, can you spell Kalani for me? Uh, that's an artist. K E H L. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Okay, sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm thinking something. Although I'm curious, who you're talking? Who you thinking of? No, no, no. It's Sounds excited. Yeah, uh, okay. So, Twitch has this. They're only running one ad. I was curious, one, whether they would be running ads for things other than like Fortnite and League of Legends video game streaming. Because obviously they're getting a much larger audience now with people like Willie Nelson doing streams. Um, So they are. They're running ads um, outside of the normal video game ad set. They've got ads for um, uh, talk and talk show and podcast streams. They're running an ad about that. They're running an ad for music and dance streams, and they're running an ad for cooking streams. And all of these ads are pushing people to install the app. Um, but for the the music and dance ad, it's it's like four frames or, or four segments. The first is it's like a comment section, and then it goes to some dude doing these high kicks with a green screen behind him. And then, and then a dude playing drums with a green screen behind him that shows a beach and a Pokemon. And then a dude that looks like he's playing drums in a music video at a venue. And then another screen of like kind of comments. And it's, I'm so and stuck it's, on it's the dude doing high seconds. kicks. That's their dancing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, and I thought it was so interesting because it's one, why would you, you, you have three kind of segments to choose. Why would you have two drummers? There are so many, <laughs> so many things you can put in there. One, EDM is huge for the music live streaming. Why would you not put a DJ, but instead you're going to mm-hmm. put two drummers and one of them has a Pokemon behind them. And the other is like, looks cool at a venue um, to show your range of drummers that you have on the platform. Uh, which feels like a very niche audience that would respond to that. Um, and who knows what their targeting is, but it was basically that ad and they had three different versions of that ad running. The only difference is the background color for the comments. So I thought that was weird that you've got all this creative content that you could create an ad out of. And the only AB test that you're running is what background color looks best with 
<laughs> um, so I was, I was incredibly underwhelmed. And because Twitch is owned by Amazon, so they've got Damn. more money than anyone else. They could be a right. huge creative team. Maybe they don't need to. Maybe they're getting so much organic interest that yeah. advertising is not a priority. Um, but I was, I was pretty disappointed by what I saw. Um, but it is interesting that they are actively running ads for talk shows and podcasts, music and dancing and cooking streams. So they are trying to branch out beyond yeah. just video games. Um, and, but in, in total contrast, then I looked at Spotify and they have so many different ads running and they're, what Spotify is doing is they're looking for, um, they're looking to make themselves relevant to people that would maybe wouldn't typically pay for a music subscription. Um, and so maybe they figured if you're the kind of person that would pay for a music streaming subscription, you probably know about us. Um, so instead what they're doing is um, they made a playlist. One was NFL drafts. So everyone that got drafted in the NFL chose a song. Um, oh, I like that. That's a, yeah. There's a good collision. Yeah. And I imagine they're targeting people that are fans of football, right? Right. Um, they're doing one for they're doing a series of ads for Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Yeah. Uh, Whoa, and specific. Yeah, I'm really proud of myself for remembering that whole phrase. Um, yeah, good thing. <laughs> <laughs> because I've I've said it on video like five times now. Um, and what they're doing there, which I really love, because it's it's difficult when you're when your company, especially a, a very white European company, uh, to run an ad set specifically targeting um, a, a ethnic group of people that you are not, right? I think that's a really delicate thing to do. Very much so. so yeah. What I like that they did is they chose artists that had that background and kind of let the mm, artists speak smart. for themselves. And so in, yeah. in a way, their, their ad dollars are going towards um, increasing the bill of the visibility of these artists. And so I think that's the best way to do it. Um, they had people like Madame Gandhi, uh, Nikki. And so that was... I know her. Uh, um, uh, Karen. Karen Gandhi. Yeah, no, I've, 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 I've done some work with her. Yeah. Madame she, Gandhi. Yeah, she's yeah, great. Yeah. I remember her speaking at She was on a um, panel. Berkeley. On yeah, I think I brought her there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's great. And, and, well, and, and what, I, what I liked about seeing her, she's such a, um, you know, someone that's outspoken on social issues. Yes, so I feel like she wouldn't have done that unless she was convinced yeah. that the people that are running this campaign for Spotify have, have the right idea. Yeah, she's very values driven. I mean, I, I think the first time I ever saw the, the future as female was on, on, on a shirt that she was wearing. At one point. Yeah, she's, she's great. And she's one of those artists that she's a drummer. She was MIA's drummer for a while. And, That's um, right. yeah. But she's, she's very smart. I believe she has... I think she went to Harvard Business School, um, but um, but she uh, and I think we're, we're we're both hammering on the same nail, which is you know these different sort of collisions or adjacencies or trying to like you know overlap different interests beyond just music. I always mm -hmm. I always reference like Zoe Keating as a data scientist who's also a musician, and and Karen Gandhi is is you know just a, a an entrepreneur who also happens to be this badass kind of percussionist and. Um, and, and, and then, and it is those those collisions, those those different, those smashing of unexpected things. So, the NFL draft, which I could give two shits about, right? Um, but I know sports people are just so hungry for anything. Apparently, that was a big, a big thing. So then, to say, okay, let's have these NFL people pick some of their playlists. That's actually interesting to me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of Smash Mouth um, being picked, but you know. I, don't think so. I think you're 15 years late on NFL players choosing Smash Mouth. <laughs> Um, but yeah, probably, probably wouldn't be your, your first choices. Um, and you there, never were, know. Yeah, there was more of that. I mean, they were doing ads that I presume were targeted towards people that are interested in health and fitness, doing ads, showcasing all of their different workout playlists. They did another one for cooking and they showcased all their cooking playlists. Um, they did one for video games and they, well, I thought was really clever. So in this video game ad, um, they're promoting the playlist that they've created. Um, and the soundtracks of different video games. So they were, I don't know the laws around it, or whether when you're distributing to Spotify, you're giving them license to use your album art in advertisement and promotions. Um, mm. But they flashed the Halo uh, <clears throat> cover art, uh, Red Dead Redemption, Witcher, Final <clears throat> Fantasy, all these <throat> things that make them super relevant to gamers that they probably couldn't, they couldn't have called up 
with the video game developers and say, Hey, let us use your logo. Right. But they were able to use the, Interesting. Uh, the album covers of the soundtracks. Interesting. So they had that music and kind of create that connection with gamers. Yeah. There's a legal construct known as false association where it's a trade, it falls under trademark where, where if you are creating in a consumer's mind, a, a kind of partnership that doesn't exist, but it's, it's, it's great. It's challenging. Um, but, but yeah, just making those, those, I mean, taking the, the law aside for a second, just kind of making those, um, quantitative leaps where, where, okay, you like this thing, this video game, this, whatever there is, there's music that's adjacent to that, that kind of surrounds that and, and enhances the experience. I mean, and going back to the whole food thing, I mean, I know it's being sort of glib, but like there's an art to music and restaurants and music and food. I was listening to some, oh, I think it was a podcast you all hit me to. Like, I think it was a Reply All podcast, and, and they were talking about, um, it was a, just a minor thread in the story, but they, they were talking about music and, and supermarkets and the, the, the people that program music for supermarkets do it at a tempo that mirrors um, a shopper's um, gait, like like when you're walking the, 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 yeah. the, the pace, because um, they do it too fast. People hurry through their their um, shopping experience. They get out of the store. If it's too slow, people get bummed out. So if you notice music in a, in a, in a, in a supermarket, it's, it, it mirrors you, the gait of, of a typical stride. And that is why, you know, in a restaurant, like if, if, if it's a nice restaurant, the food's good, the lighting's good or whatever, whatever but then they're playing something that's just so this causes so much like dissonance that you know and, and some people just, just block it out i just can't and and it, it just ruins the experience for me but um i, I think it is interesting in, in these times when we are still trying to figure out the different jobs to be done of music like how we fit music in and, and carly you talked about this ages ago but like soundscapes it's, it's all the same kind of thing yeah i was actually going to mention that reply all episode when you were talking about it at first because it is i found that to be super interesting and it also reminded me <clears throat> of the behavioral economics thing. It's like to, to match music to the pace you want people to, to take in your grocery store. But, um, but I found that episode and they've had a couple really interesting episodes about um, music specifically. I don't know, George, if you would have heard it. Yes, exactly. But Dan, I knew that you would have listened to that one. It's so interesting. And which one is and it? The, um, the case of the missing hit this one guy and it actually reminded me also of your smash mouth kind of singing this guy is trying to find a song that he can hear so clearly in his mind that he heard he's sure on the radio mm. do you remember where he lived in like just i don't know somewhere it's random. not a major market not one of the major music markets where at all yeah and uh, anyway they talk about how um I don't know if it's still the case, but record labels actually like experiment sometimes with local radio stations sure. to do that kind of localization. Yeah, thing. sure. But, but the, Reply All has done some really cool stuff with music. And that one was one, I'll share it in the show notes. Okay. But the, the um, grocery store one I think is, is interesting too, because I just, I know that so many people just don't think of, of music in those types of ways, but there is a science and an industry. And I think PJ even says like, it's so funny that a thing that I've never even thought about, of course, there's like this huge industry behind it. People don't think of, of music no. as kind of a, in well, that job industry. to be done type of way. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it's been my industry for 30 years. So like, I, I know, I know the legalities of it. I know the, the, the science behind it. And it, I think it's also why I'm, you know, acutely sensitive to it in public spaces. But even in that episode, like they 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 have a similarly kind of violent or aggressive reaction to certain Christmas songs that I mm -hmm. do. Just my, like, you know, and I think we all do. Like, I, I I can't I can't ever hear that simply having a wonderful Christmas. Like that that song, like it 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 hurts me. You know, and they talk about how people are, are you know the, the poor employees at the, uh, they reference one store where it's like around halloween they just play monster mash over and over again and it's like you know monster mash is a fine song you know a couple times a year at most but like if you hear that song over and over i mean it, it'll it, that's torturous you know mm -hmm. and it just seemed like the world listened to smash mouth on repeat for for like a decade Do you want to talk to us about what you wrote this week, George? I would also like to mention that while you shamed me for not writing anything, you have not written any original content for entrepreneurship and art in almost a month. But 
talk to us about what you've been doing for Forbes. Well, I bit so I, I mean, it's all for the same. I mean, I, uh, like I, I did, I didn't know that was a thing. Like I've also learned from listening to more podcasts since we're doing one, like the, the, apparently like you can have rules and stuff. Like, I, I mean, if that's a KPI, I'll, I'll do that. I thought, I thought it was what just, do you mean you know, rules? Well, like, like I, I've heard people like come on podcasts and say, okay, we're, we're doing this podcast and the rules of the podcast are like, and I, I don't know what they are, but you know, but like, if that's the thing, I'll sure. All right. But I, I just, my output is just here's stuff and I don't care where it goes, but yeah, I mean, I can write original things. Um, but they're all original, you know, I mean, not, but, um, I said but original you, you, for entrepreneurship and art. Okay. So I wrote, I, so I shot out a tweet and this, I think this goes to Dan's point earlier also, um, about an exit. The, the direct quote was, I'm literally begging artists to stop doing uh, uh, online shows for free right and and it was just it was just one of those like so many tweets they're just sort of shouts into the night right shouts into the void but this one the void kind of shouted back at me and and there was a lot of a lot of retweets and a lot of you know you yeah, know agreed george or whatever um and and but there was more importantly there was a kind of a stream back at me of examples of artists who are doing things that are um are, are, you know, not just here, here's my song that I've lived my life trying to write and spent countless hours and just here, hope, hope you like it, you know, which just to my mind is a continued devaluation of, of music. And, and that's not to say that there isn't a time and place for giving, giving music away for free to build an audience. I mean, totally, you know, but at a certain point, if, if we don't, if we as artists don't kind of stand up and say, no, my, my work has value and you need to pay for it. I mean, it's not the customer's fault. You know, the customer customer doesn't just as, as you all are saying about like music and supermarkets and stuff. It's not the customer's responsibility to understand how the mechanics of that work any more than it's my responsibility to understand how the mechanics of my you know water or dishwasher work or whatever. But I, I know that it has value. Um, so one of the one of the artists one of the someone someone referenced like oh george you should look at this artist joe pug who i knew i mean i know his his his, his he's a really really good songwriter and he's a, like a true working musician he's got a really cool podcast called the working musician podcast where he talks to artists the working and so songwriter. i'm sorry it's called the working songwriter thank you it's and so fact check um and so um we got we got in touch through through twitter and and i interviewed him and um it's a really great interview I mean, because it, it, it's, and in the Forbes piece, I talk about how most of my pieces at this point have been talking about the, the job to be done of, 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 of music in these times. And I've looked at everything from Fortnite to, to the Grateful Dead or whatever. But, and I say it explicitly in my piece, I said, I've, I've sort of written around the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is that sure, you know, Sweetwater is having gargantuan numbers and, and Fortnite's doing cool stuff with Travis Scott. But the elephant in the room is that the, the vast majority of working musicians just had their, their revenue disappear. And Joe starts the, the art of interview and in, in the article with, well, George, if I open my QuickBooks going back 10 years, and, and first off, like, good on him for, it's a good reminder that, that music is a business, right? And, and, and the working musician is someone who has a QuickBooks account in the same way that the person running a restaurant or whatever. I mean, it's a business and it's not just the kind of, you know, you know, some sort of joy ride of debauchery through, you know, America or whatever. It's like, no, it's QuickBooks. It's those types of things. And he says, um, if I open my QuickBooks up over the past 10 years, roughly 80 to 85% of my income on my p &L is from live performances, right? 85%. So, so he, he has managed, and, and I won't go too deep into it, but he has managed to come up with varying ways in which, because of the, the, the brand equity with which he has from his fans, that, that to, to both of y'all's points, he, his fans are willing, not only willing, eager for more. They're, they're, they want him to keep doing what he's doing, and he's created a sort of architecture of participation um, amongst them. And and he's doing fine. And one of his one of his really many salient points was, I see this as as he says I don't see myself touring again until fall of 2021 at the earliest, right? So, but when it comes back, um, 
it doesn't mean that I will just abandon these new techniques. they are just be additive to that. And, and that's a really great kind of entrepreneurial, innovative mindset. It's like, okay, I'm going to fill this void now. And, and then when, when the void that I, I'm filling has returned the way to do, it doesn't mean I abandon these things. It just becomes part of my greater sort of portfolio, which in business terms is a hedge, right? You, you, you're now hedging against these types of future things. The other really great point that he made was I have the same access as you too right now, right? He's like, you know, they, they can't, they, they have, he said like orders of magnitude, more followers or whatever on, on Facebook or whatever, but I have the same access and same tools generally. And he's right. And that, that, that brings us back to the original kind of in, intent of the internet was the democratization. And it's why things like net neutrality are so important and, and can't go away because he does have the same access. What he doesn't have, of course, is a massive organization and a record label. It's, it's, it's him and, and his manager who I think he, he refers to appropriately as his business partner. And so I'm, I'm constantly telling artists, it's like, you, you just need that one person who can be the, the the business yin to your creative yang? And Joe's that rare artist that's sort of a bit of both, but it's 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 a partnership. So, um, and it'll be the first time of many, I hope, where I am addressing the elephant in the room, and, and I'm I'm still I, I want it, I want it to be dispatches from working musicians, and I just want to tell the truth. I just want to get out of the way of the story good and bad and, and say, look, this is the reality because there, there is a, a natural kind of bias for people to either paint a, an overly bleak portrait of things or an overly kind of optimistic. And it's like, well, let's just, let's just step aside and listen and, and try to learn. So it was, it was a really good conversation. And again, I mean, with, with all my articles, if they're not just think pieces, they're, 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 they're good or they're, or they're not because of the, the person who I'm talking to. And in this case, Joe is just a great person to talk to. Yeah, that's great. I, I think it's so interesting with this, um, just the, the fact that everyone is stuck at home, right? It's, there is no, this is the moment right now, this is the moment in the future. It's, it's this series of different stages, even already when everyone was first stuck at home, all of a sudden everyone was live streaming, right? And it was, in a lot of ways, it was really cool. It was cool to see all that content coming out and all those different artists doing things we'd never seen before. Now we're getting to this fatigue state where mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. you know it's less interesting or it's so overwhelming maybe people have found a couple artists that they want to watch every week or maybe you can't watch the same artist every week because it's exhausting right. Right. Um, so how do as a single artist that has to keep on doing something has to keep on connecting with fans how do you kind of diversify your um your your, the, your content output so that it continues to be interesting and you continue to retain eyeballs and you can keep on making money through whatever monetization means you have whether it's patreon or merch sales or donations i, I think you hit the nail on that earlier and it, it's as much about retaining those existing fans which is a challenge because there's mm-hmm. fatigue people are being pulled along ways it's also about trying desperately to collide with some adjacency that, that exposes you to a new group of people, whether it is through video games or cooking. I, I really, really hope and challenge artists, and I've been saying this long before, and Dan, I think you said last week, uh, COVID's an accelerant. That, that's, that's always been a necessary thing. Like when you look at so many artists, they succeed because they find some way to, to um, Gladwell talks about loose ties, like, like find some connection point to a, a completely new circle of 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 community um, through some other other medium, and 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 you know, so whether it's art or or cooking or whatever, like it's it's really imperative for for artists to be looking for new ways to um, have that loose tie from their original group into some other other domain where people haven't yet been exposed to them because it's vast, and now people are looking and more more willing, I think, to see different different um you know music being used in different ways and different adjacencies well even within music and what i've always loved about hip-hop is that they're constantly featuring other artists and that's how right, a lot exactly. of the next generation yeah. gets discovered because they, they yeah. did a verse or whatever that doesn't happen nearly as much in really any other genre aside from right. maybe jazz um, 
jam bands do that too but but yeah i know what you're saying yeah like like i mean the whole cash money young money or whatever it was saying was okay so little wayne's really big now let's have Nicki minaj open for for him and then you know she gets big let's have drake like they were just so great at sort of introducing new Mm -hmm. um new new artists through the the popular popularity of their existing and, and it, ones it helps the popular artists stay relevant right exactly and yeah. what i'm seeing now more than ever is nearly solely due to instagram having that guest feature um, mm. the fact that two artists will have a conversation on instagram live uh makes it it's just that much more interesting when you get exposed to different types of music through someone you trust the artist that you're a fan of uh, and it becomes to make music, it makes music feel more like a community than uh, than it did before, which is really great to see. You see which artists are friends with each other or even artists that don't know each other, but are meeting for the first time over an Instagram live session. Uh, it's it's actually fun to see. And one of the things, you know, George, you keep on talking about skeuomorphism and how you can't take what happens on stage, put it in the living room. I think that's exactly right. But um, we're seeing a lot more conversation come out of musicians than before. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's less shut up and play the hits and more, I don't know, like MTV unplugged storytellers type thing. Yeah, uh, Joe talks about that. Like he, he was doing, he was doing um, like intimate high dollar kind of concerts, and and it was he'd play three songs, whatever three songs these people would request is, but then the rest of the time he just didn't talk with them, which I totally get. Right? I mean, that's what you want as a fan like it, it's great to hear the songs but boy that opportunity to to sit and like if i you know the, the, the whatever 25 year old me had been able to like ask peter buck questions or something about you know flannery o'connor like that would have that would have been as important or more important than you know listening to driver eight you know yeah and that's you know, it's it's the skill sets required of artists is constantly changing and now being able to do quality at home production being able to talk mm. rather than just play music right. Right. Uh, it's it's fascinating to kind of track the the evolution of the required um tools and skill sets i guess yeah yeah and then a lot of that will will then translate transfer even as we emerge from this so, and, and that's where amidst this horror show and it's just so bad the stress level and everything there there, there will be these innovations that come out of it because of I mean, again, as you're saying, like I, I gave a talk at Consensus, which was it's just the big sort of crypto, um, whatever convention or whatever this past week, and of course it was online. They did it really well, um, but I didn't I didn't talk about blockchain. I didn't talk about crypto at all. I talked about job to be done in music, and I talked about um, these these types of collisions. And then, of course, we see this week J.K. Rowling saying, um, "What's Bitcoin?" You know, and and so. Like, and then you've got, you've got Vitalik, the, the you know, one of the uh, inventors of, of, of Ethereum explained it in a really cogent way, you know, what, what Bitcoin is and um, that type of, I love that. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if that maybe signifies a top or a bottom of, <laughs> of the crypto market or maybe, maybe it signifies Hufflepuff, but, um, but it is a, um, it is it, it's an interesting type of collision and and it, it it then does that's what i mean about the weak ties then all of a sudden there's this binding agent you know in this way all the people that are are jk rowling fans who follow her have now been introduced to to bitcoin you know and and 90 percent of them won't care but 10 percent of them will go oh, yeah i want to dive into that and so that's how you expand your marketplace I still struggle with, and despite having worked with you um, on a crypto um, initial coin offering a couple of years ago, I still struggle with Bitcoin and even Ethereum, um, the kind of the job to be done of the coin. I see all the, all the positive applications of blockchain technology, usually on um, centralized systems for banks and places where you need to be able to audit and track changes but as far as a uh, mainstream consumer facing application where someone is directly um, using bitcoin or spending bitcoin or a um, a system that is built on blockchain technology the best case scenario really is that people don't have to know right and it's yeah, just sure. that yeah. it's it's built it's on just, in yeah. the background yeah. yeah of course yeah and, and and i don't want to go down this rabbit hole but maybe i'll write a piece of, about it but it, it's 
it's um, yeah. I mean, the, my line has always been, we'll know that the blockchain has adopted when we stop saying blockchain. I mean, it's like nobody talks about TCP IP protocols when they talk about the internet. <laughs> um, but it's uh, suffice it to say, there are an increasing number of of companies that are actually building things that are real and, and improving people's lives. Um, and that there was an entire entire wave of companies that were full of hot air and you know all substance and i mean sorry all, all you know fluff and no substance that are gone and then but but you see that in any emerging technology I mean, you saw that with the internet um so the the technology is real whether bitcoin survives and i don't know obviously i mean where it, it, it it's it it arguably is a store of value kind of in the way that gold is, but there's not enough liquidity around it. On the other hand, if you've got gold bars under your bed right now, I, I defy somebody to be like break off a piece of that so they can go buy water, you know? Um, so it's, it's, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to really opine on the, on the merits of, of Bitcoin. It, it's, but I will opine on the merits of, of blockchain as a technology. And I, and I think that that's, that's pretty, pretty solid at this point. I don't think there are a lot of people arguing that, that blockchain technology is some kind of fad. Yeah. I think that's why you don't hear the word as often. I mean, everyone Correct. used it as a buzzword. And even the people who are building blockchain-based solutions, they don't use that word because of the kind of fluff perception yeah. of it. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I... Yeah. Well, and as it, it, consumers, we care a lot more about what that actually means for us, sure. right? Does that mean yeah. I'm going to get my payment from PayPal quicker or something? Like that? Yeah, with, yeah, with less training. But again, that's, that's, it, it goes back to these tools. At, at a certain point, like we started this conversation about talking about drivers that were required mm -hmm. to, to um, power printers. Like, you know, like we, we still have, we have printers now and they kind of just work. They're still drivers powering that it's it's the the user experience has just been smoothed over so much that it is pretty much plug and play until it's not and then you get really frustrated and and that's but none of us know the technology behind how when i hit you know air whatever and share and, and, and it just prints out on my printer like that's there's so much complexity but when that was first emerging you you know you had to be sort of a, a scientist to make that work and now it's just it just I means clark's law right sufficient technology is indistinguishable from magic and we're getting to that stage where, where blockchain is kind of indistinguishable from magic and just to carly's point that's why people don't talk about it Should we, three things trace yeah. cosas <laughs> is that what that means Yes. It, really? Yeah. See, I'm pretty good at language. No, quick in Spanish. That exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, so now somebody say that tickles in Spanish. That's what I just asked you to do. Oh, you did it in here. <laughs> All right. Before we get into the three things, does anyone have a depressing three thing, and we should not have them? Go last? <laughs> I won't be depressing this time. I promise. <laughs> So no. glad we didn't end. You don't, need to, <laughs> you don't need to. You don't need to me. <laughs> <laughs> a scary podcast about a massacre. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great week. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> well, I can start. I don't have anything depressing, but I can still get started. Okay. Um, one of the the three things. Sorry, I just um, touched my hair by accident, and for everyone that cannot see, I have a. Very nice clip holding my headphones in place. Hold Can you guys post. hear me I'll okay take still? A screenshot for the mm -hmm. Oh, perfect, yeah. So while I didn't do any writing that is on the entrepreneurship and art site this week, an exciting thing for me is I pitched a piece to a publication, an online publication called The Future of Sex, um, which was published this last week. And the piece that I wrote was about kind of a new opportunity within corporate social responsibility that sex tech companies have. And um, I'm going to be taken on as a writer there. So yes. I'm going to be doing some more pieces for the future of sex, which I'm really excited about. I think there will be sometimes an overlap between entrepreneurship and art and this kind of sex tech angle. Also, since I've shared this piece with people, a lot of people ask me what sex tech means. So maybe as just a disclaimer, sex tech is pretty much anything that enhances sexuality, be it from a entertainment or education or health perspective. So 
things like period trackers, fall under sex tech to robotics and VR companies. So just a disclaimer there. So that's super, super exciting. And I will that's be amazing. doing more writing yeah. there. Yep. And um, another thing that I want to mention in my three things this week is I am constantly saving things on the pocket app and the pocket plugin and um, Normally I save them and forget about them, but I've actually been thinking about Pocket this week and going back and reading pieces that I've saved there. And I really love the podcast, the, sorry, the Pocket UX as well. Like I have the um, browser plugin, so I'm constantly just saving tabs. So then the app itself is really great. And one of the, one of the sites that I'm always saving things to Pocket is um, Eon, I think we mentioned it, I don't know on the podcast, but amongst the three of us before, they do um, a lot of like long form essay type of pieces. And so often I want to read it, but I'll think like, oh, I don't have time right now. But I read a great piece this week via my pocket app from Eon about, um, it was pretty much a piece about, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, phrenology. Phrenology, like the brain? Yeah, like phrenology when you measure bumps on the skull and, yeah, and yeah. to predict mental traits. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not really used anymore, but how mm -hmm. phrenology was pretty much a precursor to AI being used to yeah. detect criminality in people, which is something that I am also really fascinated by using AI to detect, you know, being used in like anti-terrorist attacks or at sporting events and kind of the ethics of that which are severely lacking I think but kind of going back to this like 1800s method of phrenology to like comparing it to AI today was a great piece and I only would have remembered to read it because I only remembered to read it rather because of pocket and then, actually, it's funny because I want to mention pod, uh, another podcast, and George, when you said that there are rules sometimes mm -hmm. in the podcast, there's this new podcast that I'm listening to. It's fairly new, actually, called I Said No Gifts, and it's on the Exactly Right Podcast Network, which is the podcast network started by the two women who host My Favorite Murder. Oh, yeah. And um, the host, Bridger, I'm not sure how you say his last name, Bridger Weiniger. He's a comedian, but so the whole premise of the podcast is I said no gifts. Whoever his guest is has to bring a gift. They discuss the gift that they bring, but they play like games and stuff too, where he'll give three celebrities and three gifts and like make that person give the other person a gift. It's just, I don't know, it's been giving me just a, a lot of, it's such, it's a really joyful podcast to listen to. It's just like nonsense. Like all of it is nonsense. I said no gifts. The premise of it is like ridiculous. Oh, I said no gifts. And then they bring a gift and he acts like, oh, why would you, why did you bring me a gift? And then he discusses whether it's a good gift or not. He'll also say like on a recent episode, it's like, he'll give something like throw cushions, gift or curse, like just generally speaking. It's just such a, and most of the guests are also comedians too. So it's funny. It's like pure nonsense. And if anyone is listening, especially after my transmissions from Jonestown, actually <laughs> you listen to that and you need like a real palate cleanser of just like total nonsense. I said, no gifts is definitely a new podcast oh, that's that, great. that I recommend. Yeah. Awesome. It's fun. Um, what about you, George? What are, what are your three things this week? Okay. So, um, the first one is sort of inspired by Dan's comment about one of his from last week about like having, a, you know, you wouldn't ask a hammer, sorry, <laughs> you wouldn't ask a hammer much of anything unless you were you know, <laughs> high on really you know, awesome drugs. Uh, you wouldn't ask, you wouldn't ask a carpenter why she has so many hammers. Right. Um, so I, I, since I've not been traveling, like during, during non, you know, Corona's, um, I, uh, I, I travel constantly. So I'm constantly trying to reduce the number of things I carry and I, I'd gotten it down to where I basically just carry an iPad mini and a, a, a pencil, a, you know, Mac pencil. Um, and I would take all my notes on that and, and it, it works fine, but it is as I would say, kind of skeuomorphic. But, um, since I've been, been, um, you know, sedentary, I, I, I've had these, these little moleskin, do you say it moleskine or moleskin? Because it's spelled Moleskine. <laughs> no, it's Moleskine. 
But why do they spell it Moskine? Do they? Yeah. It's, it's S-K-I-N-E, Moskine. I don't know. But anyway, I've, I've, I've only heard it Moleskine. So I'm going to go with Moleskine, though, but it, it doesn't, it's not spelled that way. Um, but, the, you know, everybody knows the, like, the black Moleskine books. Um, but they, these, I don't know where I got them, but I have these, they were like, maybe only have like 20 pages in them, and they're the same Moleskine size. Um, and now I just have them on, have one on my desk and I find myself taking notes on conversations on my little baby Moleskine. And I really like it because like with the big Moleskines, they're just too, it's like, oh gosh, it's too much stuff and I can't keep having it. Like this is short enough so that when I get to the end of the Moleskine, I, I have to go back and then look and see if I've actually done the crap that I said I was going to do on, on those notes rather than it just being like every other list that just kind of is cumulative and technical debt or whatever so I'm, I'm a proponent of one of my hammers in my life being a very um small number of paged moleskine right i think so that that's a cool little tool i'm, I'm digging my second also ties to to something that we've talked a lot about which is is kind of subscriptions or whatever um club mac stories which is not a great name but but um mac stories is a is a is a um obviously mac kind of uh, website podcast whatever um but that you can pay five dollars a month and you get um you get a, a newsletter um you get access to like i'm big on i code my own little code is an overstatement but I, I create my own shortcuts apple shortcuts I, I really find them very useful i made a i made a shortcut for um pour over coffee that like tells me you know the, all the details of, of the process of, of pour over coffee so i love making little shortcuts and, and this guy this guy's name is frederico Batici, and he, he runs the club mac stories thing and man i look forward every every friday for my club mac stories newsletter to come and i nerd out over like the apps and things and it, it's just a really really great kind of it's just so well done. So I think, I think last week I was talking about, one of the weeks I was talking about cocaine and rhinestein, rhinestones and, and how the guy would, rhinesteins, yeah. <laughs> um, how deep the guy would go on, on certain <laughs> topics. And I, it, clearly that's a theme of mine. I love it when people take esoteric things and just deep dive. So there'll be, you know, there'll be 45 minutes on, on you know, some app or something, right? And it, it, it makes me really happy. And then my third um, is, is uh, Old Bay Seasoning. And, mm -hmm. and Old Bay Seasoning, if you don't know, is, is one of those condiments. And, and it's, it's, um, it's been a huge part of my life because I grew up in, in kind of nearish to the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. And, and family gatherings often involve crab boils, which, which if, you, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's, it's blue shell crabs usually cooked, steamed in beer, and then just caked in this Old Bay seasoning, which is a proprietary blend um and it has a really unique taste and you know memory and taste and all these things are really locked close in, in the when you talk about phrenology right like the, the the bump for memory is close to the bump for for food or whatever um and so it has lots of really wonderful associations for me and so i got myself a, a, a bottle a jar of it it's a, a spice mix and um i made some crab cakes with it and it's so good and such a unique thing and it, it makes me think of things like tabasco or campari or those brands that are almost they're so unique and such a thing that there's just not really a substitute for it, right i mean there's certainly a billion hot sauces but nothing's quite like tabasco and certainly old bay seasoning is is not that different from like a cajun spice mix or whatever but it's 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 its own thing it's its own brand um, and, and I did a little bit of, of research on it and it's been around, it was created in, uh, 1939 by, by this guy, Gustav Brunn, who is a, a Jewish spice merchant who fled Germany during World War II and landed in Baltimore. Right. And so nobody really knows where he got this thing, but, but as, as my research showed, it's, it's similar to kind of Cajun dishes and Louisiana stuff. Um, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting at the beginning, it only had this one competitor, um, McCormick, who, who everybody knows McCormick's this massive spice company also from that same area. And so Brun, the creator, um, he listed 13 ingredients on, on the Old Bay label, even though it only has like four. And he was trying to, trying to throw them off 
um, you know, so that people couldn't replicate because you can't copyright a recipe, right? And so eventually, you know, McCormick ended up buying, buying Old Bay, but it's just kind of a cool story and of innovation and it's just distinctive and it, it, it made me really happy cooking with it and using it. And it's, it, I wouldn't say it's an acquired taste, but it, I think it's something that if you didn't grow up with, it's, uh, it can be a little much. Um, and, and a little bit does go a long way, but it's, it's, it's really, and, uh, that's my third thing. Daniel. A lot of variety today. Uh, <laughs> I'm a polymath, as you talked about yes. last, last weekend. Um, all right, first I'll start with a, uh, a frivolous quarantine purchase that I made that I was sure it, I was going to be let down by and it wouldn't be worth the price of admission, but I love it. Uh, the iPad Magic Keyboard. Yeah, uh, yeah, you love it, huh? I've, I've, yeah. I've read a lot about it. Yeah. I was I was so, I was like, I don't need this. I really don't. What I, size is your iPad? 11 inch. Okay. okay. And so I had the Smartfolio keyboard and I, I use uh, it with, uh, sometimes I use my external full-size keyboard uh, with it. But I was like, I'm, I'm on my iPad all day, $300. Yeah. I'll get the value out of it. Um, but I thought I would still not feel like it's worth $300. It's really great. It's yeah. really, it's. That's what I hear. It's a better, despite a smaller keyboard size than what's on my MacBook Pro, I actually enjoy yeah. typing on it more. Yeah, um, that's what everyone says. With the height of it, though, because I mean, I've essentially replicated that setup where. I mean, right now I've got my 12 inch iPad Pro on a, on a stand and then I've got my mouse, my, my trackpad, magic trackpad and my magic keyboard. And it's perfect and it's mostly perfect because I can get the iPad up to eye level, right? So I'm not constantly in, in the, from, from the pictures that I've seen of the magic keyboard, it, it still looks like you kind of have to like hunch to, to get there, right? Or, well, so th this is the job to be done. I mean, what you've done is recreated a essentially a desktop type setup with your yes. iPad, right? Which yes, is, but like, modular because I can just I sure, can, yeah, yeah, but but still, you're you're you've created a office setup, something that is yes, you can it's parts so you can take it with you, but it's not like you yeah. can just close it and walk. Correct. That's Correct. what makes this so great. Cause before this, I had the smart folio keyboard, which is fine, but it's flimsy. Yeah, right? it is. I and have that on my mini. Yeah. I, I know, and not now, but I was, you know, going, I was taking um, Amtrak up to Boston pretty regularly. Right. And right. it was just a bummer to use my, my laptop is too big to use on a tray. And so this is perfect. And this now, especially where I'm staying right now, I can take my iPad, close it shut, take it outside, sit on the patio and and read or browse the web and it feels it just feels Wait, better. hang on so just in terms of usability. So if you want it if, if you close it shut, it's still attached and you can then take it out and read with, while using your iPad like read on your iPad with the thing still attached or do you detach it? It, it, it kind of depends what type of reading okay, I'm doing. Okay. If, so if I'm browsing the web, I prefer to have the keyboard if I'm reading Got it. the Kindle or something. Or and so if you're just reading, would you un, unhook it? Yes. And I okay, do okay. love that, how, that, that's the question. Yeah. Okay. how you know, it's just so easy to unhook it and put it back. Because mm -hmm. um, with a smart folder, you just flip it around. You just, you which know, made just it super bulky when you were holding it, it right? It so yes, this, yes. I'm, I'm more likely to detach it. And yeah. just use the iPad. Yeah. So it's and then can you? I've heard different accounts on this. Can you like type use it on your lap? Like can you like yes. actually read? Okay, that's interesting. That that may be the game changer for me because my setup now doesn't allow that. I have an eleven inch, so it's it's not bulky. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. So I'm mm -hmm. not know if that changes. Really, so and how's the trackpad? You get used to it really quickly. It's yeah. much smaller. Yeah, before this, I was using the Smart Folio and a, yeah. um, a Magic Trackpad, which is like yeah. four times the size. Yeah. Um, but I, I got used to it really, really quickly. And if you, if you think about it in the sense that the trackpad is not replacing your finger, it's just adding another way to interact with the iPad. Yeah. You can still use your finger where that makes sense. Yeah and you use it as an iPad, then you get the full range of motion and it's kind of like there's nothing you can't do. If I want to be precise, I can use the trackpad. If I'm right. doing something that is, um, I don't know, bigger, more fumbly, or a finger makes sense, there's no reason not to use my finger just because I have the trackpad. So I think that's- Yeah, see, that was, that's, that's the deal breaker. I mean, that was always what my goal was. I've 90% gotten there where I never have to touch my iPad. 
I, my, my hands never have to either leave my, my keyboard or my trackpad. Some apps but just don't work with the track. I know, I know. Yeah. Cut and paste is still sort of a nightmare, but yeah. yeah. Um, all right, number two, uh, I, I rediscovered the song that I, I, I fell in love with like three years ago. Uh, it's called Argenta. It's by a band called The Four of Us. Are huh. you familiar with them? No. no. They were a, a 1980s, 1990s kind of Irish rock band. Them and you too, at one point, were like neck and neck. And now really? Everyone knows who the four Argenta? Of us are. The band is called The Four of Us. The song oh. is called Argenta, which is a recent song by them. But I discovered it, I think, two years ago because I was listening to um, back pre coronavirus, used to go for walks in Prospect Park and listen to different um, local BBC stations. I just choose a random town and listen to what the, the hosts were talking about. Oh, that's cool. It's interesting. Um, that's and cool. so I was on an Irish one and they had this band, The Four of Us, playing and they played the song Argenta which is a really beautiful song, but I, I looked it up because it's, it's so specific. It's a, it's a story and it sounds, it's like someone didn't just come up with this. Um, it's, it's about being locked on a ship as a prisoner and the conditions that you're in. Um, and it's, and the, this prisoner wanted to be home with his family and his loved ones and working the fields instead of on the ship where water is, uh, rising. Um, and it's, these guys don't know anything about that. So, and it's, yeah, and so yeah. I was like, where does this come from? And so I looked it up. I just Googled Argenta. It's about this boat called the HMS Argenta, which in the 1920s was a prison ship uh, for the Aye. British Royal Navy, uh, immediately following Bloody Sunday in Ireland, yeah. uh, where they held 263 Irish Republicans on the ship. Uh, and it was originally an American... Um, cargo ship called the SS Argenta, but it was decommissioned because it kept on taking on water and it oh. wasn't fit for use. So England bought it and used it as a prison ship. And these prisoners, one, it would constantly leak. And so there'd be water filling in the, in the ship. Um, the toilets were broken and commonly overflowed into the water. Uh, they ate so off we weren't going to end on a depressing note. <laughs> yeah. That's why I've got one more after they ate off the floors, which led to lots of disease and illness. So it's just fascinating that hearing this one really beautiful song, I encourage everyone to listen to it, we'll add it to the playlist, uh, yeah. led me on this like internet yeah, path cool. through this that. random yeah. history, and which this ship was mostly forgotten about until 2011 when someone had found like signatures of all the, um, the prisoners and wrote a book about it. Wow. Hmm. That's I love cool. that. Yeah, I love it when there's something like that that just opens up a whole galaxy of other interesting information, you know? Yeah, so fascinating. Um, the last one, which is a total oddball, goofy one, uh, Kevin James, the dude that was in King of Queens, mm -hmm. um, Paul Blart, <laughs> Mall Cop. Yeah, Mall Cop. <laughs> uh, he, he was a 90s no sitcom actor, basically. Was he in Smash Mouth? <laughs> No, but I bet he's a fan. He's kind of a tubby dude. Um, he played like, a, he was a, uh, in King of Queens, he played a FedEx driver, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, I, I, it was always on when I was watching dinner in like middle school. It was, it was just reruns. Watching um, dinner. Eating dinner, eating dinner, watching TV. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, depending on the food, maybe I was watching dinner. <laughs> uh, but so a couple months ago, he started posting on YouTube and he's, partnered with this production company called Kinane Productions, I think, like Eight Brothers. And these videos are hilarious. He, he has a series of him as a sound guy. And he's like wearing a backwards Mets cap and he's got the boom mic. And they've not just green screened and put him into these famous movie scenes, but they've got the lighting right so that he looks like he's right there. There's one, there, there's, um, the Star Wars scene in Empire Strikes Back where you find where Darth Vader reveals that he's Luke's father. And so you've got Kevin James there. Like, what? Did you guys hear this? Like, and he, Darth Vader cuts off Luke's arm and, and you see him go, oh, shit. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> the scene from uh, the, uh, the recent The Star is Born remake where Lady, whatever Lady Gaga's character's name is like refusing to get up on stage. So he did a version where he ends up getting on stage and like using the boom mic and they just like, edit it so perfectly. There's one where, uh, and they're all like a minute and a half long. So they're perfect. There's one um, with the notebook, the scene where Ryan Gosling is like, what do you want? What do you want? And he's just like, I, I'm just trying to get levels. I'm just, 
<laughs> like, where do you want to be in your life? And he's like, listen, I just want to get levels. I just want to get through this. Uh, it's so fun. It's so clever. And it's when you see someone that has had significant Hollywood success go onto a platform like YouTube, I'm so skeptical. Will Smith did it and it was just like vlogs of his opulent lifestyle of like going right. to different islands. Jack yeah. Black has done a really great job because his kid um, films his YouTube vlog. Uh, right. Goofy dude. But this Kevin James one, it's all like two minute skits and it's so. He, I'll have to watch that. He's, yeah, he's so brilliant. And I'm sure once you see his face, you'd be like, oh, I know exactly. Yeah. Who's that guy, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's I, not who you would expect to do something so great and so. Yeah, just clever. It's it's really really funny. I had this idea that um, after when Harrison Ford got really famous for um, Star Wars, you know, and and like it was, it was, I think he was partly got famous because of Chewbacca, you know, and I wanted him for all future all future movies to put a clause in his contract contract that in any movie that he was in, Chewbacca would have to make a cameo. <laughs> <first>. <laughs> so so like I just thought like like witness you know the amish movie that harrison ford's and like they just see chewbacca like around a corner and like an amish hat <laughs> <laughs> like I, I wish stars would do shit like like you imagine like that meeting where it's like okay harrison so we're gonna pay you 17 million dollars and you know give you back in and he's like oh that all sounds good i can buy another plane but uh you know, it's part of my contract. I also need to make sure there's a Wookiee at some point in this film. There's some kind okay. of camp. It, it, like the, the executives be like, yeah, I, I guess we could write, you know, a Wookiee into the fugitive. I, I, I guess at some point, like, he could just be driving a tree. Yeah, exactly. Right. 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 Okay. Ma awesome. Imagine this brilliant movie in pre-production and the executive gets Harrison Ford and he goes back to the writers and he's like, guys, you've got to write in Chewbacca. <laughs> 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 I think that'd be great. Like, I don't understand why people don't leverage their power for stuff like that. Like, the world's biggest movie star. Like, uh, yes, uh, I will make the fugitive, but uh, you're gonna have to find a way to get Chewbacca in this time. My partner. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs> this is fun. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>